Okay, drainage. Very important subject. I'm going to buzz through this in a little quicker. Uh, it's a very important subject. This equates to things that Kerry showed you. That old road, to rehab that road, if you didn't have any choice, would be very expensive. They chose to reroute it, which probably is a good idea. And so drainage becomes a uh, very important issue. That's what we're fighting all the time, is roads that haven't been drained and maintained properly. This is a, a diagram of a rolling dip. And uh, I think I have a couple more behind this one I'll show you in a minute. But uh, it doesn't work very well on steep grades. Some of you that build them probably know that. Uh, get a little bit of outslope to them. The problem I see in most of the dips I go around and look at is they're all too short. They, they're hard to put in until you learn to put them in right. But if they get them long and out of there, they'll work pretty good. But 150 feet is a pretty good length. If you're going to put a rolling dip in and do it right, start at looking at about 100 to 150 feet to put it in. You know, not the length of this room, which I see most of them put in at this length on them. Uh, here's one. Uh, it comes out of the curve and uh, up through it. Uh, right here, if you had a low boy, you may high center him if you, if you weren't careful. This is short. This is a short dip. You look at the distance here. Probably functions somewhat. I don't know what the drain out is over here and that, but uh, the next one is a little longer, the next dip, next picture. This one shows more, a little bit longer distance. You got the water coming down and shooting across the road. Not too much of a, a deflection here to get over. Log trucks roll over that real easy, so will low boys, trailer houses, horse trailers. Those are the things you're looking at when you build them kind of dips of traveling your road. If it was just a log truck, you can go over a pretty pretty good dip with it. But if you have a low boy or a horse trailers and those kind of things coming out. Here uh, we have an opportunity to fix this. Uh, this is uh, a little spring area right here that's running down. You can see this wheel track four-wheel drive wheel track and this one and uh, it was brought to my attention hey there's no slope there to, how are you going to get the water off but if we go right back up here at the beginning of it the ground is sloping this way at about three percent so if we come in here and put a uh, little diversion ditch in to divert this water out into the the grass and stuff we can handle this one before it gets to the point that Kerry showed his picture where it they had built two roads uh, off trying to get out of that uh, situation. Uh, here we've had a failure in a road. The water has run down. The culvert's plugged up right up here. And uh, in these willows, there's a spring area, wet, and uh, stretches all the way down to here. Culvert plugged up that drained it across the road. Water came down the road and caused this failure in here. They, uh, some ATVs and what have you took some picks and shovel and dug out right here, just barely enough to get a pickup by it. So, uh, what we got here is drainage failure. That's what caused the failure was the culvert not being maintained and checked and these willows got plugged up and pretty soon leaves and, and so it came down the road and washed the road out. So the diversion ditches and stuff that we would have put in would have saved that. It cost quite a bit of money to come in and fix these things. Uh, it doesn't look very big right here. I think I might have one more picture of it. But uh, we've got to start here and peel this hill down, or we've got to cut this roadway down here to get enough material to put over in there to uh, fill this large depression. Uh, this is a water bar, a little hard to tell maybe from back there, but it's one that hasn't been maintained. It's uh, probably when it was built, it was in pretty good shape. Got a little hump right here. The diversion ditch went off here and down into this open flat ground. 
But over time, it's eroded and filled in, filled in. And uh, at the point now, it's not functioning. The water is going over top of the water bar through these wheel tracks and down your road. Have another one. Uh, yeah, here's here's another example of the water coming down uh, a skid trail that is eventually going to be built into a road. Got here. Uh, this was not skid. This was a cable machine. It wasn't skid with a grapple. And I've got a few examples of grapples and skidders here in a minute. But the log actually drags on the ground too much, and you can see where it's cut in here. Got slopes on both sides where it's kicked dirt up both ways. So in order to prevent runoff in the snow and that, you're going to have to put a water bar in here and drain this off before winter shutdown. Because if this freezes before the cat gets over there to put it in, he's not going to get through that frost. He'll push up a little bit there, but not very much. Uh, this is a water bar that's been constructed. It's real close view of it. This is the berm. This is the drain out right here. And a lot of times, uh, next one's the same one, I believe. A lot of times, uh, we don't get the bottoms of them cleaned out. We do a good job of mounding the dirt up here and uh, piling it up so the water can't get over it, but we, we don't give it a good clean out. We don't get it angled right, and we leave a big berm of dirt where, it, where it's going to drain out. So make sure you get them cleaned out. This is a closure here. This water bar would not be driven over. Uh, it's too big. Uh, this is a grapple skitter. Heard some of us talk about skitters and, and what have you. They're different types. This is a swinging grapple. Uh, this part right in here can swing like a backhoe does, the arm of it. There's fixed grapples and there's swinging grapples. I I like this one probably more so for uh, the reproduction and less damage. This skidder can back up on a skid trail and reach out, bring a log to him without having to go clear off in. He also has the winch capability. You can see his winch here. Comes up out and down to the chokers that fit around the log. Uh, this is the same project Darren showed earlier. I just got a little different angle to it. Uh, they're winter logging here. This guy's going right over the stream, the back of the dozers at the edge of the stream, which works really well. You can see the willows. Actually, Darren's picture was up here earlier this, this morning. But uh, he can come along when he's all through skidding here for spring break up. He can push this debris out, push it out of the road so it don't end up in the stream. Snow melts, goes right back down the stream, and you don't know we've been here. Anyway, here's a fixed grapple skitter. Same type of skitter that we showed you earlier without the swinging grapple. Uh, he's got his irons on. Uh, gives him a little better traction in the winter and frozen ground. Uh, a lot of people think that that tears a lot of stuff up, but it, if it's done right and used right, it doesn't It doesn't hurt, hurt things that much. Uh, He's got them hooked on these chokers right here. You can see the choker line coming down. He didn't use the grapple on that particular pull. But uh, this machine here has to turn and back over in to grab them, to grab your logs most of the time. Uh, this is another picture of a log loader. Just for those that aren't familiar with logging equipment type, I throwed a few of those in just to... Uh, we don't need to build a huge landing here. Uh, they're hauling logs pretty near as fast as they bring them in here. And so the log loader can stack them up. When the other logs come in, he can bring them over and throw them on the truck and away they go. This is a picture I used earlier. Probably some of you recognize it. Found out where it was on break. Uh, this is a trespass problem that we had down there with some loggers. And... Uh, uh, they took the PVC, filled this in. You can see all the debris and er mud and everything going on here. And uh, so this isn't a good this isn't a good thing. That's what's driving these water quality things that's going on right now that private landowners and state and everybody's having to deal with. And like I was saying earlier, we need to be 
respective of that. Otherwise, the feds will move in there and then it'll be a disaster, these kind of things. Get them in there. So here's a spot where you'd use your little steel culvert. Take it back out. Feather the dirt back out both sides here. Probably a few of you are familiar with the geosynthetics. Um, some aren't. It's something that we use quite a bit. I don't know how much private landowners do. This here has a large bog area that bleeds water down here. There was a couple of options we could try to pull this water both ways into a culvert and across. But we didn't want to affect, by drying all this up, affect the riparians out in here. So what we chose to do was put a French drain in on top of the ground. You've probably heard of them underneath the ground where they use big rock, but this is on top. We come in here and we used a five inch rock and we build it up about two feet high right on top of the ground. Then we take what we call geosynthetic and I was going to bring some, apologize I didn't get it, but it looks, it's just a piece of matte looking stuff that's real thin, kind of like uh, Visiquin, only it's, it's woven. Real fine weaves in it and they build three or four types of it. Some will let the water flow through it. Others will stop the water. It looks the same, so you have to talk to the company when you buy it of which type you want to use. Here we used the type that uh, would not let the water flow down through it. So what we did is we put the rock in here, put the geosynthetic down. You can see a piece of it there. Laid this geosynthetic down. Comes in 12, 14... 20 foot wide. Then we come along and capped it with this gravel road base. And you have to be careful. You can't drive out on that and decide, well, I'm going to go to the other side and dump my gravel over there. We started right here and started working the backhoe out a little bit at a time so that we didn't puncture and break all that uh, synth or, uh, geosynthetic that we put on. The big slump that I showed you earlier where the road had actually fell on the last presentation, we used the same fabric on it. Uh, if you're going to use fabric, get some more information if you haven't been familiar with it. We use it quite a bit. Uh, Kerry can help out on that kind of stuff, him and Darren. It, it's relatively expensive, but not that bad to use. And you can do a lot with it. You can hold the water down and drive across it. You can use it like we did to hold the material from getting down into our big rocks because what it'd do is if the material went through the big, this went through the big rocks, it'd just plug it off. So now what we got is the water flowing through this. The water actually goes through that road without a culvert and keeps this whole wet area in the riparian stage it was in rather than dry it all up. I throw this one in just to see if he's all awake. But anyhow, uh, yeah, this is this is the old timers logging. Got the sleigh runners under here, and I like to play with these sometimes. I'm kind of an old buff of that kind of stuff. And how big logs? You notice they didn't have no rod in them. All nice, straight, symmetrical logs. Pretty good deal. Uh, this is going into culverts, and like a I said earlier, we uh, we only use 18 inch and larger. If we can't get an 18 inch in with a foot of fill over top of it, we'll either use a squash culvert, which is a culvert that's been flattened with a flat bottom in it, and I've got an example coming up on it, and uh, and or we'll use a rolling dip or a water bar if we can't get a foot of material over top of that culvert. This is a large culvert we put in two years ago in the mill hollow drainage. Uh, what we was doing is that road, I don't dare go back. That road was washing out over the culvert. No, I think they can remember the last one. But it was washing out over the culvert. So this culvert was plugging up, was having beaver activity. So what we found in experience is, uh, and it's no nothing that's written down in books or anything, 
But we found that if we miter these bigger culverts, I've got a better picture of the miter in a minute, but if we miter those culverts, they don't plug them up. They'll try plugging up a little bit right here in front, but they don't continue to build it up and plug it clear to the top. And so what we've done here is we've uh, we got a fishing stream, high-quality water. They did come out and check this permit for those of you guys that deal with uh, alteration permits. They uh, they do let us know that we've cleared, and there's, they the state will come out and check these uh, in all most all our timber cells. But here we had fish. We didn't want a, a fish can only swim up a culvert at a burst of speed. Now this is the wildlife people telling me and the fisheries people. I've chased them as kids and caught them in culverts, but they can only swim up so far before they give out on a steep incline with velocity of water. So what we did here, our fish, fisheries people said, we want that culvert oversized four inches and we want it set right down in the stream so that when eventually this will get some dirt and silt in here and we had to have it at a, a percent that these fish could swim up it without exhausting themselves before they got up it. and and this is a Colorado cutthroat stream so what we did is we we bought two sections of culvert they're 20 foot we put a rubber band with a steel band in the middle so it don't leak and uh, this is a, a flat bottom culvert squash culvert we didn't want it sticking way high in the air so we had them squash it where we bought it they can roll up to 30 feet of culvert in one roll in one stick up there so if you have a 30 foot crossing you could roll it in one stick and not have to band in the middle here Okay, going to the next one that shows the miter here. This is what I'm talking about, the miter here. So the fish swim up through and the beavers don't plug it. They may go downstream and plug it. They may plug you, put a dam above. Here, uh, we actually built this one with the excavator. Uh, we were having a little trouble uh, getting the water stopped going through when we put this big culvert in. So we took and put a little bit of a dam only about right here with our excavator and then the beaver just kept building it up. He still plugging our culvert. He just kept building on this dam. This is all beaver activity here. But we actually started it with our excavator. We actually give him a helping hand there. Uh, this is another failure and uh, because the culvert was too small. Didn't handle the 50, 100 year runoffs that we've had. St. George is finding that out real quick, like. Uh, but uh, you have to size these culverts for that purpose. So if you've got a long-term road, you may want to get a little advice. You know, if, you, if you're not going to probably seek some engineer or somebody that can help you, go up or down the stream and see what size of culverts are in the stream, down it a little ways or up it a little ways. It might be a mile down it where it crosses the highway. Go down and see what they've sized it for. Usually those kind of places have gone to the money of engineering that for a 50 or 100 year runoff period. And so they've put a size of culvert that will handle that kind of stuff. But if you come upstream on your property, stick it in, but you've got the same flow of water going down there and you put half the size in, you're going to have a failure. This is a large pipe. This is a 54-inch squash pipe and uh, carry a lot of water coming out. I know you, it looks like a little tiny bit of water there to you now, and you're thinking, wow, why'd they put such a big pipe in there? But spring runoff pulls from a large, large area, large real estate that comes down that stream. Okay, uh, the compaction over these. This particular culvert, types of culvert, on these haunches right here, you have to get that compacted good and uh, lay, a, lay a nice compaction bed in here or that water will go right through it or uh, seep through it. Wash your culvert out. What I'm talking about is long in here. It'll go right down along the side of that. So make sure that they get your culverts compacted. If you're putting them in yourself, 
You know, get down under there and take a crowbar or a shovel and stick it down in, along here. Even though you're, you're filled it to right here now, say you've filled it both sides, uh, four inch lifts, each four inch lift, take a bar. I didn't show the picture, but right over here, I've got a 24 inch culvert that I put in with my excavator real quick. We just dug down, took that water where the beaver dam was, shoved it all that way, and through that 24 inch here, this amount of water goes through a 24 inch right over here. And rather than dig it back out when we got through, we left it. We, we, uh, we left that 24 in there. And, uh, so we did take the water away, which is a good idea if you can do it. It's a mess trying to put them in in the water. These big culverts like that, if you, sometimes you have to though. Uh, this is a bridge crossing. Uh, we were getting ready to have a small cell over behind here, five loads. Uh, somebody had not done the homework, engineering had not done the homework on this little bridge, and it had not been designed for 80,000 pound loads. Well, we come across it and cracked it with those few loads of logs, and now it has a different bridge in there. But we actually broke, didn't fall through it, but it it broke it and cracked it. So make sure the bridge is going to carry what you're going out of there on before you start through it. Uh, Mirror Lake Highway's got one up there that we have to limit to 60,000 pounds on our, on our logs because of the bridge. This is going back to the railroad car bridge that Kerry talked about earlier. This one's a homemade one. They just took uh, logs. This is your seal. They've put aggregate under here, gravel. Had a dump truck bring a load of gravel in. Took aggregate so that they had a base on both sides. Laid these logs across. Put uh, decking across. Laid it out. Probably a I'd say that's a pretty temporary thing, whoever put it in. Uh, big R bridges, uh, steel bridge, some of you may have heard of them. They work like the railroad car type. They, uh, they work a lot like this. They're steel, but uh, the way we use them, if they're not long term, we don't pour cement under here. We do dig down, get a good footing, put in six to eight inches of road base under here, and then the loggers use these jersey barriers. Uh, our loggers have excavators, most of them. And what they've done is the state has took out some of these jersey barriers and big cement things that are along the road to keep the dividers in. They've gone and, and uh, commandeered them somehow. I, I don't know where they got them from, but that's what they tell me. But they use them underneath those bridges. And they come in an eight-foot section here, eight feet wide, 20, 24, 30, whatever you need them, and they bolt together two sections to make 16 or 12, whatever you need. They set the jersey barriers in on the gravel, both sides, drive over them, put dirt on it, up to them, gravel up both sides, drive across them for three or four years. Then we want the bridge removed, so uh, it was never intended to be a, a permanent thing. So they pick the bridge up, they undo it underneath here, there's about 10 bolts they undo. They take the excavator, put a chain on it, lift this section up, lift this section up, lift this barrier out, this jersey barrier out, both sides, load them on their low boy, and they go to the next crossing, wherever there we require a bridge. Usually it's in high fishery streams and things that are very sensitive where we, we don't want to get in the stream necessarily fording through it or playing around in inside of it with the culverts. Yeah, spring breakup. Uh, this contributes to road failure probably as much as anything. We try to go up them too quick. Not only the, the logger, but me as an individual, if I own private land or something else, I got my four-wheel drive and I want to go up here and check, see if the elk's been up here or how the sheep are doing up in here or, or something. We get a spring snowstorm. And this is what happens. We didn't plan for this road to be an all-season road. It was basically a 
road just built for dry, more dry weather. But you can see what's going on here. Don't take a rocket scientist to see that this is too soft. We're using it for something it wasn't intended for. If we were going to use it for all season, we need to hard surface this stuff. Put, put us in some drainage here, culvert through here, pull down a drainage here, pull a, a ditch here, both sides ditches, and drain this out or raise it with rock or something. And like I say, we get too excited sometimes, I think, and we go too early in the spring when the spring breakup's coming out. Another example of that where we've gone too quick, see the big holes starting to come. I'm sure all of you have been in that situation one time or another. But them can be prevented if we do early planning. We know we're going to use that road early in the spring or late in the fall. Another example, that's, that's a major hole. If you fall in that thing, you're there. It doesn't look deep to look at it, but it'll stick a four-wheel drive in a heartbeat. So, yeah, that, that needs a gate on it or it needs to be rethought about and fixed up. Uh, this is another drainage problem. See the water coming down through here. The road's actually here. It's using the road like Kerry had showed, comes down, right down, and right down across the road. So there's another example of spring runoff that, you know, we just kept going up and up it before long. The, the stream started coming right down the... And this is an intermittent stream. This isn't a stream that flows all year, just in the spring of the year. This little example here is stay on the road. Uh... The road's pretty hard where the truck's sitting here, but the snowbank was right here. And uh, the logger was logging back about five miles back here, and his skitter was there, rubber-tired skitter. Some young teenagers decided to go for a weekend run, got to here, and their big snow drifts, they couldn't get around. So they thought, well, we'll just come right up around them. Well, uh, you can see where they got hung up and buried. Well, as they were walking back, they noticed the logger skitter sitting there on Sunday night. So they started his skitter. And they brought the skitter over to get him out. And here's where the skitter was sitting Monday morning when the logger came back. He had to bring his D6 over. They, couldn't, they didn't have anything to hook to it. Had to bring the D6 over to get it out there. So that that happens when you drive off of these hardened, long-term roads. Here's the one I was telling you about earlier. Uh, this is an aspen conifer cut that we did. Uh, roads were te all temporary in here. Didn't want any roads after we got through with this, this aspen cut. You can see how it's really starting to grow to aspen. Next photo will show more. All this green. Here we got the excavator. We're pulling it back in. And uh, these heal over real well. And uh, you notice we didn't get real wide in here. Even though it was a clear cut, we had a, a bank cut in here. We're not real wide. Minimal damage, minimal. And here we go. This is right in the beginning of that closure. He, he had just, he's right down the road closed, and I walked above him and took this picture. But he's putting this slope back up all the way along, put a little debris out on it, keep things from trailing on it, working ATVs, trying to get up it. Here it is now, uh, afterwards, you notice all the little aspen shoots, they really grow fast out here, so uh, a minimal impacts, you can see it starting to heal a year later. This is uh, Blazard Lumber Company took a road right through this. Uh, about eight years ago, we got a road that went right through here and over to a timber stand over there. This, this can show you what can actually happen after it's been rehabbed, if you take care of it. Uh, we have people that say, hey, we don't want you crossing those meadows. Those are beautiful out there. Stay over in the trees. But we can do less damage sometimes by crossing these dry, open meadows than we can if we try to move the road over here and zigzag back and forth. We can actually go up through these openings. 
But you can see it really growed back. You can see a little piece of the road left here, right there that went over and into the back side, but not much. So you have it's you have the capability of doing it. The end.